joining me today is Sarah Pickman, a PhD candidate um, from the program of History of Science and Medicine from Yale University. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. And, and I, I should also mention a couple of your other uh, responsibilities, the Associate Editor, of History of Anthropology Review, Co-Chair, Graduate, and Early Career Caucus, History of Science and Society. On top of that, I mean, doing all your, your other responsibilities, working on your, your thesis um, and, and a whole bunch of other, other interesting work. So appreciate you coming on. Um, excited, to, excited to talk a little bit more about your work. I, we were talking about this off air, but for, for listeners, I think you, you put it really well that um, the work that Dr. Rachel Gross does and the work that you do is, is very complementary. And, and in a lot of ways, um, her work picks up kind of, or you overlap um, a little bit, but her work picks off where, or picks up where yours leaves off in some ways. Um, you know, you're looking at out, outdoor clothing, outdoor gear, um, around what time period? So um, mostly uh, 1850 to about 1930, 1935. Um, some of the stuff in my dissertation goes back to the very early 19th century. Um, but yeah, I'd say mostly second half of the 19th century, um, first third of the 20th century. Um, when I'm talking to other historians, we call it the long 19th century, which means that technically you can go past 1900 and you, know, you kind of fudge it a little bit. But yeah, I'm mostly a 19th century person. Right. Well, that's that's kind of an era that we're not as familiar with when it comes to gear history. And and one thing that uh, Dr. Gross and I have talked a lot about, and and others we've had on the podcast, is sometimes I think people who work in the outdoor industry don't recognize how old it really is. And we're talking about American history largely, right? So again, not a super long history in the grand scheme, but um, in terms of American history, we, we, we don't think of the outdoor industry as, as being very long lived. We, I think a lot of people think, oh, it started with Yvonne Chouinard, right? right. In the 60s, right? That's where it began. And, and maybe those who are, are plugged in, um, and even those who aren't plugged in, you think about the L.L. Beans of the world, you think about Eddie Bauer. Um, but even before that, Abercrombie and Fitch, right? You know, while it was still an outdoor, outdoor company. Um, but but there, I mean, there's an outdoor industry that existed long long before that as well, which is what I'm interested to to get into with you a little bit more today. What what drew you to this? Um, where where did your journey start um, when it when it comes to outdoor history? Definitely, kind of a roundabout way. So um, I've always been interested in dress history. I have uh, you know just always been interested in old clothes. I collect vintage clothing, um, so that's part of it. Um, I studied anthropology as an undergrad, and the, the first kind of inklings of this project sort of happened when I was a master's student. I went to this program uh, at this place called the Bard Graduate Center, which is affiliated with Bard College. It's in New York City, and the focus of the program, it's pretty interdisciplinary, but the focus is material culture, so a fancy academic way of saying stuff. Um, like you, The focus is kind of on objects and the connections that objects have to history and to culture from different perspectives. And I was doing a project where um, I had a term paper to do for a class. Um, we had to pick an object and we had to look at it in different ways every week using different theories that we were reading about and then kind of do a big final paper on it. And the thing that I chose to focus on were a pair of sealskin boots that I had that I picked up, again, collecting vintage stuff. Um, they were from the 50s. Um, they were from a Canadian brand that um, was pretty short lived. And they were clearly meant for a kind of mainstream white fashion audience. Um, they were pretty short, uh, much shorter than traditional Inuit sealskin boots would be. They had a rubber sole. They had laces up the front. Um, they had a tag inside, but they were also kind of generally cut in this way that traditional Inuit footwear is, is cut, the, the sort of same shape of a boot. And um, so I started, you know, doing a lot of research on um, indigenous Arctic clothing and um, the ways in which some of those kind of forms and materials have trickled into mainstream um, Western fashion um, or kind of been appropriated depending on how you want to look at it. And 
as part of that, I started reading accounts of different Arctic explorers because a lot of the earliest encounters between indigenous Arctic peoples, the original makers and wearers of these kinds of clothes um, and Westerners happened in the context of these Arctic expeditions in the 19th century and then also before. And the thing that really struck me was a lot of these white explorers were, um, had a lot of really interesting things to say about um, Inuit clothing and technology in general. And they had a lot of praise for these people and you know, were, um, had some admiration for people who had managed to find a way not just to survive, but to thrive in a very challenging environment. And as somebody who had studied anthropology in college, that was pretty striking to me because it was really the first time I'd come across white people from that time period, from the 19th century, who had anything good to say about Native people. You know, usually it's um, when you read accounts from that era of white folks talking about Native Americans, um, Indigenous Americans, it's, a, it's in a pretty um, disparaging, uh, to say the least, uh, way. Um, and not that all uh, white Arctic explorers like thought of these people as their equals necessarily, but that when it came to their material culture, to their stuff, and particularly to the clothing, they were really impressed um, and thought of it as being kind of ingenious in a lot of cases. So that sort of pricked my interest. And I started reading, I got really into um, reading accounts of Arctic and then Antarctic explorers, um, just kind of got obsessed uh, with reading some of these expedition accounts. Um, they were, I can talk a little bit more about this later, but they were written to be engaging books. These were books that were bestsellers when they came out. So I found them really enjoyable to read, even though there was also obviously a lot of problematic stuff in there, um, yeah. just because of the time period in which they were written. And so that sort of got me thinking about gear for expeditions more broadly, um, going from this uh, clothing that had been appropriated from indigenous people used by white Arctic explorers, and then thinking about other things that would have been brought on those expeditions, how people planned for those kinds of expeditions, how they packed. Um, and I got so into it that I decided to keep going to grad school and <laughs> do a PhD um, that looked at material culture and exploration. So that's, that's a kind of a long story, but I, I got to it in a kind of a roundabout way. Right. Well, I, I think the work that you're engaged in is so important in, in, at so many levels because the, you know, largely what we've been covering both in our, uh, on this podcast series, as well as in our archive at the Outdoor Recreation Archive, we're, we're covering the history of modern outdoor brands, right? And, and I think that's mostly where our, where, where our focus is, is on, on brands, right? And there's a point in history where you know, people are making their own products, right? And some of that, you know, take well, a lot of that taking inspiration from, um, you know, the people that were there before them, right? Um, wherever they were in, in America or up in the Arctic. Um, and, and so this is kind of largely untapped for us. But I, I, I think that acknowledgement is really important that, right, we're, we're talking about outdoor products companies that have largely built, you know, consciously or unconsciously, their products and inspiration comes from, um, people who have been making outdoor products for, for generations, right? Um, which, which has got to be interesting for you. There's, there's such a long period of time that can be um, studied. Is there, is there a point where you, you, you know, how far do you go back in, in your studies or is it largely reserved to, to um, you know, one century? Yeah, I try to keep it um, mostly between that, those sort of years, sort of like 18, 50, maybe a little bit before, um, up until World War II. Um, I think World War II is kind of a, a turning point. I'm Dr. Right. Rachel Rose, who's been um, on the podcast before. She's written about this. World War II is this moment where you have a lot of outdoor experts being hired by the Quartermaster Corps of the US government, kind of lending their outdoor expertise for the military, gearing up soldiers, which obviously means producing stuff on a massive scale, kind of unlike uh, anything that's been seen before, really. Um, so that's in some ways a kind of convenient stopping point for my research, also just because historians like the sort of convenient boundaries sometimes. So, you know, it's not uncommon to have a dissertation that ends at World War I or World War II, just because that's a kind of convenient stopping point. Um, but it is, and, I, and on the other end, I try to kind of keep it within the 19th century um, for a couple of different reasons, one of which is that this is the beginning of uh, mass tourism, which is something that overlaps with some of the stuff that I look at. Um, sometimes it's difficult to differentiate exploration from tourism, which I think is a kind of an interesting problem, mm -hmm. but um, you have uh, mass tourism really getting started in the early 19th century. Also things like um, different kinds of print culture that make expeditions make exploration much more visible to a wider segment of the Western public. 
Um, but it would be possible to take some of this stuff even back further because people have always traveled. Um, they've always kind of moved around outdoors. Um, it's just that their relationships to travel have been different in different time periods. So, you know, for example, I've talked to some folks. Um, there's this new sort of academic subfield called mobility studies that looks at mm. travel um, and kind of people's movement. And that could be anything from immigration to tourism and um, sometimes i've talked to some folks and they say well you know you might say tourism starts in the 19th century but what about medieval pilgrimages you know could we think of those as a kind of tourism because um, people are traveling to do a specific thing they want to see a specific thing it might be you know a particular uh, cathedral or a saint's relic but you know that is a kind of um that is a kind of travel too um one of the things that i think is is interesting about the the kind of early 19th century um, and going back a little bit further, maybe into the 18th century is that there's um, a lot of the gear that's that what we would think of as you know, sort of outdoor and travel gear back then is actually made for the military. And that's where a lot of the stuff comes from. Um, and so when I've been doing my research, some of the earliest uh, stuff that I've been able to find related to my research is about this whole genre of furniture called campaign furniture, um, camp or campaign furniture, which was made for uh, European militaries, um, especially I look at the UK, um, so for the British military in the 18th and 19th century. Um, so that kind of comes in at the beginning of my, my project. And I see that as sort of the starting point for a lot of the gear that I end up looking at later on, because a lot of the explorers that I, I end up looking at, they're inheriting a tradition of military campaigns. Mm -hmm. So in some ways that's that's kind of like at the very beginning of the project. So that's those are sort of how I bound it in in time. It, it, it really is interesting to look at the origins of certain products um, or certain iterations of the products, right? Because if you look at, at tents, like modern yeah. day tents, Civil War pup tents, right? That's kind mm -hmm. of the, and you, you move, um, move on and you get the A-frame, but it's, it's just an iteration of a pup tent. And you have um, A-frame tents up until um, Jack Stevenson in the 1950s and 60s who makes, you know, you, you get um, some innovations in materials and you get aluminum tent poles and, and, and you can start to create more rounded um, structures. But that's a long time to be using a, really a, a technology, a design from the 18... 1860s, right? Yeah. That kind of a very, you know, that's almost a hundred years, well, a hundred years of yeah. um, using largely the same tent design. Um, kind of an interest, interesting to see that evolution. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of these, these forms, right, and it's again a connection to older forms of travel. Um, people have been putting themselves in tents for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. uh, again, military, um, you might even think of like convict labor, people working outdoors on prison gangs. Um, you know, the Civil War, obviously, you know, sort of, so, you know, kind of common soldiers, um, but also these religious pilgrims, um, also people who are kind of itinerant travelers, putting themselves in, in tents, again, literally going back centuries. Um, so you have this, this form that uh, kind of gets more elaborated in the, um, in the 19th century, but it's not like the camping tent sort of evolved out of nowhere. It's just that more people who, who didn't have a reason to be outdoors, who had a reason to be outdoors other than being a soldier, um, you know, being a kind of itinerant traveler, uh, being a religious pilgrim, working uh, outdoors, being a trapper maybe, that those people started to need tents. Um, and so, yeah, again, you, that's when you start to see some of the evolution of those different, different forms. Right. I think a lot of our interest, I mentioned this at the top, but a lot of our focus is on brands and, and products created by brands. In this, in this time period, are you starting to encounter companies that are, are developing to make outdoor products? for? Because this is a transition phase, right? From people making their own gear, making their own equipment. Um, ex, you know, these explorers, um, you know, meeting the Inuit people and taking inspiration from them making their own products um, and making their own equipment. Um, that that's where we, I feel like we really pick up is we start to to track you know who are, who are the earliest brands making commercial product is that something that you you started to discover in your research? Um, 
in the 19th century, it's a little bit ad hoc. So if you look at um, expeditions, in the British case, at least, a lot of the big polar expeditions um, are military expeditions that are um, run through the Royal Navy. And so initially, they're looking at people who are doing military contracting. Um, the thing that we kind of think about as branding is a sort of identifiable identity for this company, like a company that you would turn to as an authority on a particular kind of product doesn't really come about until the end of the 19th century. I think advertising is a big part of that. Um, but yeah, initially it's quite ad hoc. So, you know, you might look to, um, if you were leading an expedition, you might look to folks that you knew had been outfitting um, military, had been outfitting soldiers. Um, towards the end of the 19th century, you also have people picking up from brands that maybe hadn't been set up to do outdoor work, but you think um, could provide something that you would need on an expedition. So one of my dissertation chapters is actually about chocolate. Because chocolate becomes a big part of the food provisioning for a lot of these expeditions to the Arctic, but then also even to some warmer places. Um, because even though it is, you know, chocolate does melt, it does last pretty long. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty portable, both as a bar and as powdered cocoa. Um, if you mix it with uh, sugar and hot water, it makes something that's kind of comforting and nourishing. Um, and also at the time, chocolate was still thought of as being more of a health food than a dessert or a health food in addition to a dessert. It was thought to have a lot of energizing and healthful qualities. So you have brands like in the UK, um, Cadbury, um, also JS Fry, which is another brand that outfitted uh, expeditions with chocolate, was eventually bought by Cadbury. Their, their main consumer base are these general consumers. They're sort of home consumers, but they're also outfitting expeditions, again, with literally hundreds of pounds of chocolate. Mm -hmm. And in return, the for a lot of them, explorers will give endorsements to these brands. So they'll provide uh, written quotes, or they'll write a line in their expedition account saying, you know, we brought such and such amount of Cadbury chocolate with us, and it was it was a great help to us um, in the frozen wastelands. Or they'll, um, they'll lend their image to be used in an advertisement. And so that, I think, is also part of this early evolution of branding, is that you get, um, you get celebrities lending their name and their image and their textual endorsement to these companies so that they can kind of build up a distinct image. You know, we, we will give you free stuff and discounted stuff, and you'll help us become more recognizable to the general public. Because explorers are big celebrities in the time period that I'm looking at. So this is kind of a big deal if you can, if you can get an endorsement from somebody like that. The original influencers. Exactly. Exactly. In some ways. Huh. Yeah. Well, I, 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 on, on that same note, um, I, I think about a Cadbury being the original cliff bar in a lot of ways, right? We yeah. think about this outdoor adventure foods mm -hmm. um, and Cadbury is really the, the, I, the, I, the, the beginning of that in some ways. And I had never considered that. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. A lot of these brands, they said they, they're brands that wouldn't have like the outdoor market, the uh, market for explorers, that's sometimes not a big enough consumer base mm -hmm. to supply, you know, to keep a company afloat. So you have companies that are selling to the general public, or um, in some cases, like another company that I look at in the dissertation, um, Borrows Welcome, which is a medical company, medical supply company. Most of their big contracts are with um, the military, both in Britain and abroad. Um, but they're also, they, they invest a lot of money in getting endorsements from explorers, because even though that's a small amount of income or a small amount of expenditure for them if they're giving them stuff for free, it is a major payoff in terms of advertising because they then they can kind of build this brand identity that they've they've given stuff to people who've gone to very extreme environments and so they've kind of proven the goods um, in these extreme environments they've sort of field tested them and um, and then they'll these advertisements will catch people's eye because again the explorers are big celebrities that people are following them. Uh, in newspapers or in their, through their books, uh, public lectures, radio. Um, so they are very recognizable figures. It's not so different from today um, in yeah. the outdoor market. The outdoor market is obviously much, much bigger than, than what it was during that time. But, but you have outdoor companies marketing the pinnacle athlete, right? Um, mm -hmm. Climbing the highest peak or, you know, all of that. Um, but the majority of, of consumers, uh, the more majority of people who are purchasing those products are maybe buying a North Face jacket so that they can go on a walk, right? Or, or wear it in cold weather to go to work. Um, but, but they recognize the importance of marketing that pinnacle athlete, that aspirational um, marketing um, goes back, back to this, this time, which is really interesting.
Um, I, as you were talking about explorers and outfitters, uh, Filson was, was one that, that came to mind, uh, maybe one of those earliest brands, it probably wasn't a brand at the time, but, but more of an individual. And, and we see a lot of that, right. You know, later on Eddie Bauer, Ella Bean, these companies that are, are named for individuals, people who are these outfitters. Right. Um, and I think their story is interesting. Like you said, um, outfitting people, um, during the gold rush, yeah. right. Who are going out um, explorers in that way, um, which is really interesting. They're they're probably one of the the earliest who isn't a true outdoor company, um, but was making outdoor products or products that would cross over into that market later on. And now we see Filson where they're they're at today that kind of blend that workwear but yeah. outdoor audience. Really, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's two thoughts that I have on that. One is that. Yeah, the um, people who are mining um, prospectors are, are also a kind of part of this because again, they're, they're not quite, you know, it's like, are they explorers? They're not really tourists. They're kind of traveling to some of these places, some of which are quite far from where they started or might be considered extreme environments in source of, uh, you know, trying to make money. Um, but they are also a market for people who need sturdy things outdoors. Um, and again, so they kind of get, get pulled into this early mix of, self-identified explorers, uh, tourists, um, uh, people who might also be uh, missionaries or working for colonial governments who are going abroad and need stuff that um, need to sort of outfit themselves with a, with a whole kit. Um, and the other thing about Filson, uh, you mentioned Filson being a single name, which is really interesting. Um, a lot of brands um, like uh, Heli Hansen, mm. you know, for example, Heli Hansen is named after Heli Yule Hansen, who was a real person. He was an individual who started out making a, um, a durable clothing for uh, fishermen and kind of sailors uh, in Norway. And then, you know, 100, 120, 130 years later has wound up as this very expensive, very elite outdoor brand. Um, same thing with Burberry. Burberry, like Abercrombie and Fitch, is a brand when you tell people that they were originally an outdoor outfitter, they're mm -hmm. usually very surprised. Um, you know, and it's turned into a pretty elite uh, luxury brand. But Burberry started making things for people who are interested in hunting, in shooting, um, outfitted a ton of explorers, especially polar explorers, um, outfitted the British military during World War I, um, made safari clothing, um, all kind of around 18, in the 1880s, 1890s, um, 19 aughts. Actually, the, um, according to their company history, the first explorer to give them a big endorsement was um, Friedrich Nansen, who's on my, I brought my Osnes uh, skis behind me, my uh, cross-country skis. So this explorer brand, branding thing is still happening. Um, Friedrich Nansen was a major polar explorer in the 1890s, who's, um, whose face is still, 1890s, uh, early 19 aughts, who's whose face is still gracing this um, contemporary Norwegian ski brand. So, wow. um, but yeah, he was the first, the first major explorer to publicly endorse uh, Burberry and say that he'd used it on expeditions and it kind of took off from there. Wow. Well, this, this through line, right, of, of outdoor brands and their connection to exploration is, is really interesting. It's, that's the through line that I see even today, right, in, the, in modern day brands. That, that hasn't changed, which is interesting. Um, oh. Forgot. So uh, there, there was another connection there, which is that Tom, Burberry is named after Thomas Burberry, who was the founder. So again, right. single, name, uh, single name companies. Well, you you bring this up. I I, I I'm, I'm blanking on if it was in your if in your master's um, thesis uh, or your your piece that you wrote. Um, but but you talk about the uh, the the connection between exploration of the outdoors and colonization. Um, which which is is fascinating um, and and should be acknowledged. What what are your thoughts there? Do you, do you mind sharing a little bit more about that that yeah, connection? Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge explorers have usually been talked about um, in historical accounts as being these heroes who were driven by a thirst for knowledge. They wanted to see new places, explore new places. Um, you know, that there's a, some kind of innate human lust for travel, and they just wanted to. Be adventurous and see what was beyond the horizon. Um, and some of these people, you do get a sense that they they were not comfortable living within the constraints of the society that they lived in had set for them, and they did want to do something more unconventional. But it was also within the context, especially in the 19th century, of expanding European and American empire. Um, and a lot of the these expeditions were about knowledge gathering in the service of, if not explicitly for government to 
you know, politically stake new colonies than to at least have more knowledge about a particular region for trade, for navigation, um, sometimes to squeeze out another European or American colonial power. Um, and even in a place like the Arctic um, or a place like Antarctica, where you don't have some of the resources that other um, colonies were set up to gather, you don't really have the potential to have settler colonies like you do in places like let's say Australia, New Zealand, even in the American West, you know, it's hard to set up farming communities in a polar environment. Um, but still these countries are competing to be the first to put a flag there to show that their country has the most technology, that they have this global reach, um, that they can do something for science um, that will set them apart from other countries. So there's a lot of competitiveness there. It's a kind of um, symbolic colonization. And I'm not the first person to argue this. There's a lot of other historians who've looked at this kind of symbolic colonization, especially in a place like um, Antarctica, where you had Norway and the United Kingdom competing to be the first to put an expedition at the South Pole. Um, or even something like Mount Everest, um, where you have a lot of countries competing to be the first to do particular kinds of Himalayan ascents, uh, if not for formal colonial reasons, then to sort of stake their country's claim to this space in a kind of symbolic way. Um, so there is, there is that connection. And I think that there's also a connection with gear, which is that a lot of the materials that go into what kind of becomes this early set of gear in the 19th and early 20th century are materials that um, start really being cultivated and um, processed on a mass scale because of colonialism. So one of the other things I look at in my dissertation is rubber. Uh, rubber is the basis for the first um, waterproof, totally impermeable fabric that gets mass manufactured in, um, in the UK. Um, it's kind of informally called uh, Macintosh after Thomas Macintosh, who was one of the early innovators in this field. And uh, and rubber is a colonial product. It's, it comes from, the original rubber trees come from South America. Um, they were brought to Europe in the context of colonialism, um, first kind of introduced to European scientific societies. And then the British really took a, a big interest in rubber and set about um, transplanting seeds to Southeast Asia where they had these major rubber plantations. Um, and of course, uh, Belgium as well. There's um, lots of horrific histories that have been written about Belgium and their rubber colonies in Central Africa. Um, so these, this product that eventually becomes something that is part of a gear item, the part of waterproof fabric, uh, the raw material itself wouldn't have gotten to Europe without these colonial connections. Certainly wouldn't have arrived in Europe in big enough quantities to be um, mass manufactured if not for uh, colonialism. And, and also the, the reason we have synthetic rubber is because the US was trying during World War II, again, getting to the end of my dissertation, um, the U.S. was trying to develop uh, synthetic rubber, rubber substitutes, because World War II cut them off from a lot of their rubber supplies, um, because a lot of places where the British had rubber colonies had been taken over by the Japanese army. So there's, there's all of these different little colonial connections that you can follow through following the raw materials. Right. That, that, that connection, that, that through line of exploration, there's, there's a complicated history that comes with that, right? That, that carries forward from that time to, the, to today. And I, how, how important do you think it is for modern day outdoor companies to understand that history, um, to, to be able to avoid um, participating in, in a form of colonization in the outdoor industry today, right? I think about the the outdoor industry and and, and really the country in, in general is, has wrestled a lot with um, just those relationships between um, settlers and indigenous peoples right and and the outdoor industry is is engaging in those conversations right um, around protecting um, you know places like bears ears significant yeah. to indigenous peoples sorry I, I can see that through line that's very complicated and problematic in a lot of ways um, between those original explorers and this idea of exploration uh, and and you know participating in the outdoor industry today exploring lands that have been explored you know yeah. long long before we were here what, what are your thoughts on that and the importance of modern day companies understanding this this history yeah, absolutely. I mean that what you the that thing that you said at the end um, really kind of touched on something for me, which is that um, this idea of exploring places that where people already are. I mean the 
one of the things that I think about is how this rhetoric of exploration, or even the word explore, is used so much in the outdoor industry and in tourism in general uh, to you know, kind of entice people. It still has a lot of cachet for people, but it's often used in this kind of unproblematized way where we assume that exploration is inherently a good thing, whereas mm -hmm. for a lot of the people who were on the receiving end of encounters with explorers, it was often not a very good thing. It was the beginning many times of being colonized, of um, being, um, you know, being on the receiving end of the sort of European and American incursion that people did not want, and that um, that ended up causing, uh, you know, all, all sorts of problems, which we we could spend hours and hours talking about. So, um, so you'll, you know, it's pretty common to see, you know, I saw an Airbnb ad pre this is pre COVID. Um, but I got an email that was like, don't be a tourist, be an explorer. And it mm -hmm. had two people in a kayak, um, you know, kind of sailing around what it looked like somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so it's pretty common to see um, things like that that tell people, don't be a regular tourist, don't be, you know, this, just don't be basic, don't be, do what everybody else is doing, be an explorer. You know, you can strike out on your own without really saying that actually, a lot of these explorers are extremely problematic figures. And so maybe we should think about how we frame adventure or exploration for, for people. And, and again, you brought up the conversation about Bears Ears and uh, City National Parks in the US. Um, I think that's another great example too. I mean, it makes me think of, there's a book by a historian named Carl, Carl Jacobi called Squatters, Thieves and Poachers, I think. Mm. Uh, which is a fantastic book about the creation of the national park system, um, or mm. specifically about three different national parks that he focuses on in the US. And he demonstrates that a lot of these national parks that are, um, you know, of course, today we think of as these fantastic resources, we're trying to, the outdoor industry and the park service is trying to get more people out into these spaces to experience nature. But they were created in many cases through a process of kicking off people who were living on the land uh, you know, before, long before the park system had ever been a thought in anyone's mind. And in many cases, uh, like Yosemite, these were indigenous people who, these were their ancestral homelands, their ancestors had lived on these lands for thousands of years. They were there engaging in subsistence practices that were inconsistent with what white park administrators wanted. So they didn't want people using the land in, uh, like for foraging or for grazing. They wanted the land to be totally empty so that white tourists could come in and experience it. And even in places like the um, Adirondack Park in upstate New York, there were indigenous people living there. There were also in the mid early 19th century, there were a lot of white settlers living there. Um, people who were pretty poor, also kind of on the margins of society who were trying to eke out a living, um, trapping, hunting, fishing, acting as, as very early wilderness guides. And those people similarly had to be sort of forcibly removed from places where they lived so that the park could be made pristine. Uh, the park could be kind of, um, you know, opened up for these people who wanted to think of themselves as explorers, um, who wanted that sort of pure tourist experience with nobody else there, nobody living on the land and spoiling it. So there's a really complicated history that could be, you know, again, could be an hours long conversation. And there's a lot of fantastic historians who've looked into, into this, but it's a, it's a problematic legacy. And um, as you alluded to, I think that something that the outdoor industry is starting to grapple with, but, um, but there's a lot more work to be done. Right, absolutely. And, and with that said, you know, we again, we could totally have a whole host of other conversations, which I would love to in the future. Uh, I, I'm going to pivot to back back to your your research. Um, you know, you, you you talked about diving into the the histories of these different explorers, and I, I guess what was what did you want to accomplish when writing your um, well your 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 piece expedition fashion from the extreme? Yeah. So um, that yeah, that piece is um, is based on my master's thesis. Yeah, uh, and it's part of a um, really awesome museum catalog that I was very fortunate to be a, a part of. Um, it was for an expedition of expedition, sorry, an exhibition, very similar word, at the Museum of the Fashion Institute of Technology, which looked at um, high fashion that's been influenced by clothing for the outdoors. I was looking at um, polar expedition and clothing, and I was really interested in this issue of why some explorers chose to wear indigenous style fur clothing, fur and skin clothing, and why some of them didn't. Because I think the, from a 21st century vantage point, you might think, okay, we're talking about the era before synthetics. 
So what is the warmest, most protective clothing out there for an Arctic or an Antarctic environment? It's gonna be fur and skins. So why were there people who chose not to wear those things? Um, and there are some explorers, so I, I looked at three particular, uh, particular explorers in that, um, in that thesis. Uh, Robert Falcon Scott, who was a Brit, Roel Amundsen, who was Norwegian, and um, Robert Peary, who was American. Uh, each one of them uh, made particular choices about clothing. Um, Peary, who was an Arctic explorer, was very gung-ho about fur, um, or was very, you know, sort of, I don't want to say gung-ho, he was very, he was a big proponent of using um, fur clothing um, and adopting Inuit-style dress. Um, for Amundsen, it was more of a mix. Scott really relied on mass-manufactured um, clothing from Burberry, and then later for his last expedition from a British company called Mandelberg, um, clothing made out of wool um, and, and cotton, and only used fur for things like boots and, um, and mittens. And I was trying to untangle sort of what do these clothing choices say about these three individuals as expedition leaders, about the particular styles, but also about what was going on in their home countries that influenced their choice of clothing. So whether it was how the cult of the explorer as a celebrity was developing, the visibility of being an explorer, how you had to dress the part and present yourself. Was it about expedition sponsorship and getting gear um, because you, you, needed, you needed money and gear from particular companies in order to actually make this expedition financially feasible? Was it about um, experiences with, firsthand experiences with indigenous communities, but what kind of experiences and how explorers related on an individual level to indigenous guides and interlocutors. So it was a it was a way to use those three leaders, these three expedition leaders as case studies to kind of get at some of those issues. Just as an example, um, Peary was um, one of these sort of explorers who really relished being a celebrity. Um, mm -hmm. He, uh, his big claim to fame is that he's um, often thought about as the first person to reach the geographic North Pole. Um, that's pretty contentious. A lot of folks today accept that he got very close, but he probably didn't actually reach it. Again, whole other history there about that debate. Um, but he, um, he really adopted Inuit style technology and not just clothing, but also dog sledding, um, traveling and eating uh, seal meat, uh, food, kind of gathering food off the land. And, uh, and in some ways learned a lot about how to travel in the Arctic and how to survive in the Arctic from the Inuit, in particular from a community of people called the Inukuit or the uh, polar Inuit who live in Northwestern Greenland. Um, but Peary also, by the same token, that didn't really translate into what we would call today a sort of respectful, reciprocal relationship with these communities. He was quite exploitative of the people he worked with, um, his native guides, and also Matthew Henson, who was his African-American second-in-command um, and companion. Sometimes he's referred to as Peary's valet, and Peary sometimes did appear to treat him like a servant, um, even though Henson was actually learned how to speak Inuktitut, which um, Peary didn't and kind of in some ways knew a lot more than Peary did. Um, Peary wrote in ways that were very derogatory of his Inuit guides. Um, he wrote that part of his genius as an explorer was to take advantage of these people and to exploit their technology. Uh, he actually claimed that uh, white men should have children with Inuit women because they would inherit the strength and uh, kind of physical strength of the mothers, but the uh, brains and rationality of the fathers, because mm -hmm. this was a time period when in a lot of Western race science was thought that white, only white people could be the most rational and the most um, intelligent uh, people. So, you know, it was a very complicated relationship. And um, so Peary, even though he, he dressed in furs and skins, um, didn't, it wasn't, didn't mean that he, um, he had absorbed sort of a, a relationship of reciprocity with these people. He was really using it for his own aims, which were to reach the North Pole and to make himself financially secure through his expeditions. Um, whereas uh, somebody like Amundsen, uh, who was who's often sort of written about as this consummate expedition planner, this incredible uh, project manager, if you want to use like a 20, late 20th century term, um, planned his expeditions really down to the finest details, had a mix of um, Inuit style clothing. He'd, uh, he'd previously had an expedition in the Arctic and he actually overwintered with an uh, Inuit community in central Canada and had learned about Inuit style clothing, furs, skins, lay, how to layer, um, which is a big part of Inuit clothing technology, how to take care of furs, had really absorbed a lot of those lessons, um, but combined it with some very Norwegian things like skiing um, and really thought hard about how to match uh, different kinds of gear 
uh, in terms of like both clothing and transport. So he knew that if you were doing Nordic skiing across Antarctica um, and you were going to sweat a lot, you couldn't actually couldn't wear furs. They were going to be too heavy and too bulky. So he had to balance that out with clothing made out of, um, out of wool and cotton. Whereas um, Scott was very invested in um, using British made brands. Um, part of that might have been because he often had money troubles. Um, these expeditions that were quite large were needed a lot of fundraising. They were pretty expensive to pull off. Um, and Scott had some sponsorship from particular brands. On his last expedition to reach the South Pole, he was outfitted by a company called Mandelberg uh, from the UK um, in uh, what we would think of as um, sort of Burberry style uh, anoraks and um, loose pants traveled by uh, largely on foot and by ski, um, intended to use dog sleds and motorized sledges. Motorized sledges didn't work out. The dog sleds um, were only used for part of the expedition. So um, this is get, kind of getting into the weeds here, but there, there was, um, uh, yeah, so basically just that, um, I'll, I'll back up a second and say that, so there were these very different styles of um, expedition um, outfitting. And um, so that essay was kind of an attempt to think through what these different styles were and what they reflected, not just of the individual expedition leaders, but also of the sort of worlds that they inherited, the cultures they came from, and how they thought about the relationship between their own bodies and the environment. Sorry, that got, that got kind of rambly. I might try to... I might no, try to that was that. great. <laughs> so I guess I should clarify. So the FIT exhibit was Expedition Fashion from the Extreme. And then yeah. your, your thesis was, is it Dress, Image, and Cultural Encounter in the Her Heroic Age of Polar Exploration? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, how, how was that, like, how did that develop? How did you get to participate in this kind of an exhibit? That sounds amazing. Yeah, so um, the exhibit was fantastic. It was uh, curated by um, a team from FIT. Um, the editor in chief of that particular, or the editor of that catalog volume, Patricia Mears, who is, I believe, still the um, vice president of the um, museum at FIT. FIT, obviously, this really prominent um, fashion design and related technologies uh, school in New York City that has an amazing museum that has a um, fantastic costume collection and puts on several exhibits every year, at least, you know, pre-COVID. I'm not sure what they're, they're up to at the moment. Um, Patricia had this idea to do a, uh, an exhibit that was about how high fashion was influenced by clothing for, for the outdoors. And she'd been working on this and I just totally serendipitously happened to know somebody who whose partner was working for the museum at the time and we got to talking at like at some party and the the mutual friend was also a grad student so this person was like oh, another grad student you know also somebody working on their master's thesis let me ask what you know the question i have to ask them is what they're working on so he asked me and he said oh i think their museum is working on something that kind of sounds like that so he was able to put me in touch with Patricia Mears and we talked about it and I said, I would just love to give you my research because I'm working on something that's very similar and I'm trying to get it out into the world. So like, please take my research if you would like to. So that was great and it gave me a chance to kind of polish up my master's thesis, get it published um, in the catalog um, and have it be in dialogue with these other essays which were about uh, clothing that had been influenced by space exploration, clothing that had been influenced by underwater exploration. Mm. Um, clothing that had been influenced by safari fashion, uh, and clothing that had been influenced by mountaineering clothing. So in, in all these cases, the, the curators were looking at really like high fashion, kind of like couture level, um, you know, big fashion houses who had been influenced by things like Inuit clothing for polar exploration by Eddie Bauer's um, 1950s mountaineering gear. There was actually a couple of really early Eddie Bauer's pieces in the exhibit. Um, by things like Burberry in the case, and Abercrombie and Fitch in the case of Safari, how designers today are really into neoprene that comes from diving suits. Uh, so it was really, um, it was really like an interesting take. Um, and I haven't seen another exhibit like that before. Um, I think the, the catalog is just like, you know, I, um, I don't want to brag, but I think it, it turned out really well. And the other thing that was in the catalog, which was great, is that Lacey Flint, who's the amazing curator and archivist at the Explorers Club in New York, also wrote a short essay about what, what is exploration from, the, from the, the standpoint of the Explorers Club. So what's exploration? What does it have to say to fashion history? 
Uh, so it was really a fantastic project to work on. What was the response? It was really, it was really cool. Um, a lot of people were really into it. There was a symposium that was organized in conjunction with the exhibit. So there were a lot of great folks um, from the fashion uh, history world, a uh, bunch of different fashion scholars who addressed these issues of how do we think about high fashion, the outdoors, outdoor clothing, outdoor gear, the environment, um, and all the ways in which they've mixed together. And the, I think the videos for that symposium are still online for anyone who wants to check mm -hmm. it out. Um, it also got some great write-ups um, in the fashion press, some really good reviews. I'm not sure if the catalog is still in print. I've got a couple of copies, um, but it's still circulating around. It was published by Thames and Hudson, which is this big um, art history publisher, which, which was really cool. Um, yeah, and it's, had, and it's also had a kind of afterlife online because the, there was a blog for the exhibit as well. And the blog, the blog posts along with the symposium videos, I think are still there for anyone who wants to check it out. And we had an opening party at the Explorers Club, which was pretty cool. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to check that out and look up all those materials. And, and if we can track down some, some catalogs, we, we will try to do that. We'll, we'll have to add one to the collection, to our archive. That'd be, that'd be awesome. That'd be um, awesome. I, I think that's, it's, it's a really interesting space that you've found yourself in, um, this intersection between fashion and the outdoors and outdoor equipment. Um, hey, just, we talked about this off air, but it's interesting to see the outdoor industry influence fashion um, more and more. I, I think a few years ago, I, I think people were wondering, is this a trend? Um, but when you have VF Corporation owners of the North Face um, buying Supreme um, and engaging in collaborations with Gucci, it seems like this is only the beginning of of those worlds colliding. Yeah, I think it's. I think one of the things that's happened is, um, and Dr. Gross got into this a little bit in her interview as well, is that um, it's the culture of dressing in the US especially has become much more casual, especially this year because everybody's at home. Um, but people have gotten more comfortable with the idea that instead of having outdoor clothing, which is for specific outdoor activities and you would only put on if you were hiking or backpacking or going skiing, what have you, um, or yoga, like to be honest, that you actually can walk around and wear that stuff every day. And that is part of mainstream style. And that it also marks you as somebody who kind of aspires to that outdoor lifestyle, even if you live in a major city and never really leave that major city. I think something that else that has happened is that a lot of outdoor gear is pretty expensive relative to, say, the average income of most Americans. And so it is kind of a status thing. Um, so something like, again, um, Helly Hansen, not an American brand, but a ski jacket that could cost several hundred dollars, even something from Patagonia. Again, you know, the stuff is well made and it will last you a long time. And if it breaks, they'll repair it for you for as long as you own it. But the upfront cost is quite high for a lot of this stuff. So, um, so I think you, you do start to see a lot of people wearing this stuff as status symbols. Um, I also think of a brand like a uh, European brand like Montclair, that's mm. specifically a skiing brand. And so it kind of evokes this idea of the sort of skiing lifestyle, luxury, you know, jetting off to Switzerland um, to ski in the winter or, you know, maybe to um, to BC or to like the Laurentian Mountains. Somebody who has the kind of money to um, to use a jacket like that in that way. Of course, they might not actually be skiing at all. They might just be wearing it around on the street, but they want everybody to know that they could do that if they wanted. Well, I don't, this hasn't hit me until now. I, I think I've always known that outdoor activity is a, is a luxury for, for people. Um, it, it's, it is an exclusive activity. It, well, certain of those acti activities are more, ex you know, yeah. um, you know, have, have a status that comes with them. Skiing comes to mind, right? Um, mm -hmm. That that's a luxury for, for a lot of people. Um, and so I don't know why, but but it, during this conversation, that's really hitting me that this isn't so off base for outdoor brands to be perceived as as luxury items, right? I mean, a few years ago, Patagonia became the became the the uniform of the tech bros in in right. Silicon Valley, right? It was it, you know it, it's this isn't so off base, and I think people maybe those who have been in the outdoor industry. Um, for as long as they have, aren't recognizing that. And I, I know there was a lot of pushback for the, the North Face Gucci collaboration. Yeah. People 
really questioning, well, this isn't true to the North Face. Um, I was like, well, maybe it is more than we think, right? Because of that, that status of what, what it means to be an outdoor enthusiast or an explorer, someone who participates in these activities, um, which, which is an interesting question. It'll be interesting to see how things develop, especially as these relationships are only being more and more solidified, right? With the North Face and, and Supreme now being a part of the same company. I, I think that's, that, that opens up more interesting questions for the future. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's, it's you're right to point to this thing that there are scales of sort of participation. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you are doing like trail running, that might be a less expensive sport to get into than right. downhill skiing, uh, especially if you live in an area where you don't have, you can't easily get to places where you actually can ski. And so you've got to factor in travel costs. Um, right. So, so yeah, so there's maybe even like a hierarchy there, which is something I haven't really thought about, but um and again, it, it, it almost relates back to earlier exploration in the 19th and early 20th century in a way, because as exploration became, I like to, to when I've talked about this to students before, I say, you have to understand that in the Victorian era, being an explorer was a job. It, it wasn't a sort of like lifestyle identity, like you know, we might think of today with the tourism marketing, like be an explorer, be an urban explorer. Um, it was a job for a lot of these people. Um, and like a lot of jobs, it came with um, professional societies that you could join, publications you read, people you kind of circulated amongst, um, and then of course money. And a lot of these explorers came from, um, you know, fairly comfortable cir family circumstances, not all of them, but a lot of expedition leaders did come from um, middle class or affluent families because expeditions were really expensive to put together. And you could save money by getting gear from particular companies in exchange for endorsements. Uh, but you still had to pay people to be on your expedition. You still had to pay for transport. You had to pay for other stuff that you couldn't get for free. Um, and if you were lucky, you could make that money back or even make a profit when you came back selling your story, writing a book, going on a lecture circuit, selling photographs, um, selling exclusive rights to newspapers to your story. Um, but it took money to do this kind of stuff. Um, so again, that's that might also be a connection with, um, with how you know, at least parts of the outdoor industry operate today. Although, of course, we all hope that things do become more more democratic and more accessible. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I you you mentioned this earlier on, and I wanted to come back to it a little bit. But these early explorers in the Arctic, looking at their clothing as equipment, as a mm -hmm. life saving, you know, it's personal yeah. protective equipment. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think that's an interesting conversation that, that goes back to, to this era that you're studying, but I think the, the outdoor industry still wrestles with that idea of um, most outdoor companies started as equipment companies, right? They're making, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sleeping bags or tents or climbing yeah. equipment, whatever it is, some kind of hard product or gear. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had a conversation with um, the team at, at Black Diamond, largely known as a ski manufacturer, climbing company, mm -hmm. Um, they've really, and the full name of the company is Black Diamond Equipment. Mm -hmm. Um, they've kind of really made a major push into apparel. Yeah. And I think that's, that's common amongst most of these outdoor companies is they recognize that we make such good equipment that, and there's a limited number of people who are going to participate in these activities. And the idea is they're only going to have to buy one of these, like they're hopefully only going to have to buy one climbing harness mm -hmm. versus a jacket that changes every year you know, they need to come back to us and, and buy the latest um, style, right? Um, but at the same time, these companies are trying to market apparel as equipment, something that that um, really equips you to participate in outdoor activities. So, uh, Dr. Gross and I talked about this in a, in a podcast we just released about Gore-Tex, right? And, and mm -hmm. other outdoor brands in the way that they market their products. It's, well, you need us to be equipped to go and brave the outdoors and be that explorer and I just think it's an interesting conversation, especially in light of outdoor and fashion coming together more and more as these companies recognizing the need to play in that fashion space, um, yeah. not only for the financial health of their company, but um, it, it also just brings up these um, larger questions that the industry wrestles with, right? It's, uh, you know, we exist to help people get outside, but um, at what cost, right? Are we make, are we causing more people to buy more things that they don't need um 
are we engaging in kind of the fast fashion or fast fashion side of things? Um, just large questions that I'm not, I, I'm not sure if there's a question there. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I was thinking about, um, that idea mostly as clothing as equipment, um, which I, I think in a lot of ways sets, sets the industry apart. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think it's, it's the kind of question where there isn't one single answer. And certainly I think sustainability is a, is a huge issue right now. Um, it's the kind of thing where, you know, there, there isn't going to be, you know, people still want these items um, and people, even if we're just restricting it to people who do outdoor activities, people will still need to refresh their gear every once in a while. You hope you don't need to go through a new climbing harness that often if it's right. well made. Um, but people do still want to buy and there will be a market to buy more things but maybe the question is, is scale, maybe the question is materials, recyclability. Um, you know, there's this huge issue now with microfibers, a lot of which come from um, synthetic fleece that are this huge environmental pollutant. Um, in, in a, especially in a place like the Arctic, um, you see, you know, there are not a ton of people who live there year round, but yet the environment is clogged with all these micro fleece particles from further south. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's just a, it's a thing that kind of, needs needs to be continually wrestled with rather than um than one particular you know than saying you know yes this is the one solution right although we could also you know all be like bernie sanders and have like one burden right ski and just yeah. keep wearing that season after season meme after meme uh, right yeah truly <laughs> yeah but yeah that that hits close to home i know for those who might be listening to this maybe that that trend will have already passed us but yeah but it's, it's already pretty long-lived so yeah um, well, I, you know, I, I wanted to get to a little bit, maybe to kind of wrap up the conversation. I want to be courteous of your time, but, um, you, you didn't have enough with, with the master's degree. You, you've, you needed to continue to dive into this, this yeah. space. There's so much more to explore, um, from a research perspective. Um, what, what motivated you to, to go back and do the, um, to do the PhD or you're engaged in that right now, but. What are the questions that you wanted to to dig into that motivated that? Yeah, I mean, I think some of it was um, was timing. You know, um, in my in my in my own personal life, I was I'd been doing the masters part time while I was working, and I was ready to kind of take a different step and either move into a different job or do something different. So, you know, in that way, like, oh, of course, more grad school um, seemed like the right thing to do. But um, but I was motivated. I mean, I kind of got obsessed with this. Um, with early early gear, so part of it was just wanting to kind of follow that to the end. And I knew after the master's thesis, you know, polar exploration, clothing, even in a niche area like that, looking at these three specific explorers for the thesis, um, I knew that there, that like as into the weeds as I gone with that, there was so much more out there um, that I wanted to to look at and other other pieces of gear, other eras, other places. Um, but it, but as I sort of thought about, okay, well, what do I want to do besides just looking at explorer stuff? Like, what is, are the big questions there? One was thinking about extreme environments. So I look mostly at expeditions that go to places that we now think of as in this category of extreme environments. So polar, desert, uh, tropical, high altitude, um, and um, have I left anything out? Polar, polar high altitude, Desert and, and tropical, basically. Yeah, I, I don't really look at underwater and space exploration. There's a lot of people doing great work on both of those things. Mm -hmm. But for the era that I'm looking at, it's kind of before a lot of those, um, that, that kind of exploration takes off. Um, so I'm looking at these places that were thought of as being extreme, but the question is extreme to whom? So that gets us back to these issues of, these are places that Westerners are coming in self-identifying as explorers but again many of them have indigenous residents even if the north nobody lives at the north pole there are indigenous communities in the arctic who've been there for thousands of years even if nobody lives at the summit of mount everest the everest early everest mountaineers got there with the they wouldn't have been able to get there without the aid of local guides local porters who lived in himalayan communities for thousands of years um, building on the kind of the knowledge and expertise and the and the labor of these people and that is a story that plays out in all different parts of the world so if one person's extreme is another person's home where is that dividing line and kind of who make, gets to make that uh, that call gets to make that distinction and part of the reason that this era also fascinated me is that this is the time of a lot of really um, kind of overwrought expeditions. There are explorers who have a kind of lean expedition style, 
um, especially a lot of the Scandinavians really pride themselves on, uh, you know, kind of stripping everything down to the basics. Although even somebody like Anansen or an Amundsen still brought a lot of stuff with them um, for their expeditions, for their crews. Um, but it's not really the, this is like, this is not the era of backpacking light. Um, in a lot of cases, you have people um, bringing all of the goods that you would expect to find in a metropolitan Victorian uh, home with them. So uh, people aren't just bringing the bare minimum in terms of food, you know, calories and, and fat. They're bringing uh, different courses for every day. Um, they're bringing tins of meats, vegetables, different kinds of liquor, um, British expeditions that are bringing things like pate that would be considered delicacies, um, all different kinds of very heavy sorts of uh, forms of entertainment. So it's not uncommon for expeditions that travel on ship and that are planning to overwinter in an Arctic, ex uh, Arctic environment to bring theatrical costumes and props so that people on um, the crew can put on shows for each other to entertain each other. Um, gramophones, um, heavy, other heavy musical instruments, things for playing music, um, for portable furniture, kind of campaign furniture style stuff that folds out, um, portable bathtubs, um, all kinds of, of things that we now look at and go, these are impossible luxuries. How, why would you ever bring so much stuff if the, if the goal is to spend as much time exploring a particular region, mapping, surveying, doing scientific field research. Why you bring all this crap, <laughs> you know? Sounds like um, early glamping. Yeah, early glamping. And so I think it's easy to dismiss that sort of thing, um, to look at these, um, and there are a ton of guidebooks that have been written for um, expeditions and for camping and for um, military travel and things like that in the late 19th, early 20th century that make recommendations for packing. It's easy to look at these kinds of things and go, this is ridiculous. You know, this people brought way too much stuff. Mm. Um, and even if, you know, now we have the benefit of hindsight, like back then they, they also must have known that this was way too much stuff. So I was also interested in kind of probing that a little bit and saying, well, you know, if we take it seriously, if we, if we take these people's packing list seriously and say, okay, why are they bringing all this stuff? If, they're, if the purpose of the expedition is to go out to an extreme environment and kind of prove your, your mettle, prove your, your manhood in this kind of, this very challenging place, it's you against nature, why are you bring all the comforts of home? Why are you bring all those trappings? And so I kind of wanted to, to poke at that um, and investigate it and say, you know, is this really about um, people's vulnerabilities? They're trying to, they, they say one thing about what exploration is and how, um, how much courage and manliness it takes, but actually people feel quite vulnerable in these environments they're not used to. Is this about the 19th century when you have the industrial revolution, people just have a lot more stuff than they, they had before. It's goods or mass manufactured goods are much easier to get a hold of, they're cheaper in many cases. So are people just enchanted with having all the stuff? Is it about showing off the technology of your home country? Because you're going into places where um, the current 19th century Western science says, you know, we are, we are rational people. We are the most sophisticated, technologically advanced people. The people you encounter who don't have these technologies are inferior to you. So is it about showing off in that kind of racist, scientific, racist but validated with science in the 19th century sort of way, you know, kind of what's, what's the thought process here behind why people packed these, these mm. things. So those were some, some of the bigger questions that I wanted to kind of um, probe at um, and hopefully answer in a way that my dissertation committee finds satisfying. But, but honestly, to me, just kind of looking at some of these packing lists and trying to figure out what the thought process was and what it would have been like to try to recreate a world from that time while you were traveling um, right. is still something that really fascinates me. That is, is really fascinating. I can't wait to, to hear more about, uh, about that. Where are you within that, that process right now? So, um, I'm a couple chapters away from finishing the dissertation. So um, the main thing right now is to try to actually finish that, that very long, um, you know, very long document. Um, I've written three chapters so far. I've got a couple more that I've got planned, um, but I'm also working on some, some side projects. I'm working on hopefully trying to get a, a paper together about the uh, 20th century American Canadian explorer, Billy Homer Stephenson, and his interest in Inuit clothing. Um, he was a really interesting explorer for a lot of reasons, but was somebody who tried to get Inuit clothing to be mass manufactured by the American military for soldiers. Yeah. 
So I'm trying to look into that a bit more and hopefully write something up about that. Um, and uh, yeah, I have some other like potential projects on the horizon, but the dissertation is the main thing right now. Well, that's great. Well, good luck on on the last few chapters of that um, and defending that. Uh, it's an incredible, it sounds like an incredible project. Um, how how do people, I guess to, to wrap up, how do people stay in touch with you, uh, read the work that you've already produced? Um, what's the best way to, to reach out to you and stay in touch with everything that you're you're doing? Yeah, that's, that's great. I would love to hear from folks. I'm on Twitter. I'm uh, at Sarah M. Picks. So I'm happy to just, you know, shoot me a DM. Um, I'm also around um, reachable by email. So it's sarah.pickman at yale.edu. Um, I don't have a website at the moment, but I do have an academia.edu page that you can find if you Google me. And that's got my CV, which has um, links to all the stuff I published, um, a bunch of blog posts, my piece from the expedition catalog. And uh, happy, always happy to talk to folks, always happy to hear from other people who are interested in gear. Well, I guess, I guess just as a final aside, but um, how do you feel about the, the future of this space? I know that I, I've been fortunate enough to, well, you found us mm -hmm. and, and I'm grateful for that. And, you know, to be connected to, to Dr. Gross and the work that, that she's doing. Um, how, how do you feel about the state of this community? It seems to be forming. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that, that we're the ones that are doing that, but it seems like we're, we're finding each other, which is, which is yeah. great. Um, wh where do you kind of see the, the future of this, this space? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I think that there are some, um, some people doing really exciting work kind of that plays into this a little bit. So um, when I started my master's thesis, there really weren't that many other folks that I could find who'd written about gear specifically. There's, um, there's a book called Invisible on Everest. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, by Mike Parsons and Mary Rose. Um, Parsons is, a, is, a, is in the gear business. Um, Rose is a, a business professor. So they'd written this book that he's in, um, but that was really kind of the only secondary source that I'd come across. Um, and since then, I've gotten plugged into people who are doing history of exploration, maybe not so much focused on gear, but focused on some of these other bigger issues. Vanessa Heggie just came out with a book called um, Higher and Colder, mm -hmm. which is about expeditions, mostly polar and um, high altitude expeditions in the 20th century that looks at uh, science and especially physiology and how physiology was carried out on these expeditions. But she looks a little bit at gear as well. There's a book I've actually got sitting over here called Expeditions Unpacked by Ed Stafford. Ed Stafford's kind of like a, a Bear Grylls type mm. from the UK. And this is more of a, the book's kind of more of a coffee table book that looks at different famous explorers packing lists. So it's not, doesn't get quite into like the theorizing um, and some of the other academic work, but it's still a you know really good resource. So people are starting to do work kind of around this this area. Um, I think this you know we're also at this moment in academia. I think where people are really interested in, in doing interdisciplinary work. So people who otherwise might have said, "Oh, I'm an environmental historian. I only work on people's relationship with their environments," or "I'm a material culture person. I only look at stuff," um, are having conversations with each other. Um, I know that I, I'm, you know, definitely building on a lot of great work by other historians that are out there. So I'm excited to see more people kind of coalesce and around this, you know, this area and say, look, oh yeah, actually outdoor gear is a thing that I look at. So, right. Well, I'm excited for the future of that. And I'm excited that people are finding each other. And I'm, uh, you know, I am going to look into the work of all of these people that you recommended because I wasn't familiar. So, um, I, I appreciate you taking the time. It's It's been fun to talk with you about your work. Uh, it's been just fascinating. Um, and again, like like we said throughout, we could probably do a part two and part three on on a variety of topics. So, um, you know, look forward to, to talking with you more. And, and if you ever want to come on again, and we, we I'm sure there's plenty of topics that we could dive into, but this has been great just to get to know more about your work. It's my pleasure, Jace. Thank you so much for asking me. Mm -hmm.